Hitting revenue targets is hard and requires constant hustle. Last quarter's success is already forgotten. Learn the mindset and tactics of today's most successful revenue producers in B2B marketing and sales. We call this the revenue hustle. I'm your host, Tom Hessen, navigating you on this journey. Today's show is sponsored by Nine Lenses, an interactive assessment platform that enables you to add instant value to your buyers and allows your sales team to tailor business conversations focused on the pain points each and every time. Check them out at NineLenses.com. Hello, this is your host, Tom Hessen of The Revenue Hustle. And today I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Darshan Jane to the podcast. Darshan, welcome to The Revenue Hustle. Hey, Tom. Great to be here. Well, I'm so excited to share our conversation with um, our listeners today. Um, Darshan and I have got to know each other over the past four or five months, just working on some projects. And Darshan's a really interesting guy, and I just had to have him on here. He is the vice president at Blue Prism, which is an excellent SaaS company. And he leads the banking, financial services, and insurance industry practices within the Americas. And so I'm going to let Darshan introduce himself, introduce Blue Prism. Uh, It's a fascinating company, and what he's doing there is really cool. So Darshan, give us a little bit more context there. Sure. Thanks, Tom. It's uh, quite a mouthful if you look at the whole thing. Um, So sometimes I just shorten it to VFSI, which is Banking, Financial Services, Insurance. But overall, even to shorten that, it's just financial services. So, so Tom, my role at Blue Prism, we um, were one of the preeminent um, robotic automation uh, companies. Uh, We have a platform that offers digital labor. And in fact, uh, I can go into this in in a lot of detail, but just at a high level, uh, Blue Prism invented the whole category of this particular um, robotic software called RPA. Uh, We're 20 years old, um, but in about 2012, 2013, we were picked up by Gartner um, and and credited with creating the space. So we're not a a new company, um, although the space somehow seems new. My role at Blue Prism is to, I guess, provide the bridge between the industry and the technology. So, you know, there's tons of new technology that comes out every year and how do customers really navigate this? And so in the areas that I specialize, insurance, banking, financial services, um, and I've got a background in that myself. So what I try to do is bridge the challenges that this industry and the set of industries has with what the technology can do to solve those. And I'll just give you one really quick example. Whether it's insurance uh, and you're getting a quote um, for, let's say, your car uh, or you need uh, house insurance, or it's in banking, you're opening up a new um, stock uh, brokerage account uh, at one of the big banks. So in all of this, we call this onboarding, and which is, hey, fill something out, they'll run a credit check, they want to have your driver's license, you know, we want to make sure that it is you. So everybody knows that this, nobody complains, except guess what? Even though it's a nice little kiosk on the website that you may be entering this thing, or if you're still doing it through you know, paper, which is fine. On the back end, the banks, the insurance companies, and so on, they have a massive amount of manual effort that goes on to onboard you, open your account, do the credit check, have you know humans looking at this. What we've done at Blue Prism is, uh, over the years, all of that has now been automated. Uh, and you would say, well, gee, isn't there big systems that do this already? Yes, there are but no system does everything. Our digital labor, as we call it, digital workers, really are the equivalent of humans doing all these steps automatically, mm-hmm. 24 hours a day, um, and, and they don't get sick with COVID. So, <laughs> so that's really what we offer. And my, again, my role is to help um, my customers um, you know, sort of speak their language, understand their pain, their challenges, and then position what we do in a way that's consumable by them so that they don't have to do all the scratching and figuring out just just this apply. And that's what I do. So I'll work with a number of folks, you know, in the fields, um, our sales directors, customer success, um, BDRs and so on. We have quite a crew, um, but often I get pulled in or I start that discussion and then they sort of, we have a nice team effort on that. Got it. No, that's really helpful to kind of understand how the industry experts align with the sales and customer success teams because i mean that's an important i suspect not every salesperson supporting a you know financial services client knows everything in and out right um which is keeping you uh handsomely employed there at blue prism so um and and so darshan we've talked a lot over the past few 
weeks and months just about your view on customers and growing the accounts and just some of the thoughts you had were just striking to me and uh, which is why I wanted you to come on here. So without further ado, give us your first revenue rule. So thanks, Tom. And again, really excited to be here. Um, the first rule that I have is really understanding the language and speaking the language of your target customer audience uh, or sector. And what I mean by that is, if you don't understand what it is that they do, how they do it, what keeps them up at night, um, what's happening in their industry, how do you enter that conversation? What do you have to add? So if you're just looking to say, hey, I've got some cool tech, you don't really understand what they do, but you just think the tech is gonna solve it, you may have a small chance to get in, but you're gonna lose out eight times out of 10. Because it, think of it as a, you know, if you're at a wine and cheese, it's a social affair, um, it's one of these networking events, you don't know that many people there. You get your glass of wine, um, you have a little name tag on it, but as you sort of mingle around, maybe there's a group of two or three people already having a chat, right? And you just gently go in there. You first understand what it is they're talking about, and then you say, hey, I have something to offer on that, and then you get into that conversation, and now you're an accepted person in that small group. Whereas if you have no idea, how do you contribute, and then you eventually leave? So in the same way that social circles work, in my view, business to business, B2B, selling, relationships, networking is the same. Understand the language. You don't have to be the expert on it. Uh, I happen to come from a background of banking. I have been offering consulting services in this space for 20, over 20 years now. So I just happen to know this, but it's something that can be learned. It's not that you have to right. be a domain expert. You can learn this, but if you don't know the vocabulary, what's happening in the field, then it's a much, much more challenging conversation. And it immediately goes down to the lowest common denominator, which is, okay, Tom, suppose you were pitching me. So tell me about your tech. Tell me about the solution. Like it's that quick. There's no time for relationship building, no time to commiserate with your fellow audience about challenges and so on. If you don't build some of this, then if the answer is no, you don't come back. Um, so in Japan, they spend so much time relationship building before they actually talk business. And there's a reason, because if I can have stickiness with you and I understand your, your values and your company's goals and my company's goals, all of that, we're going to have a really good partnership. Now, here in, in North America, we don't have as much time. That's not our culture. But I think if we could take a little bit of that Japanese approach, an Eastern culture approach to say, I get your business. I understand your challenges. Um, and have a whole discussion on that. You may have something interesting to offer. Maybe you don't, but at least you're speaking that language. Eventually, right. you'll come down to say, hey, you know, these particular challenges, let me share with you how I helped someone else in the industry solve right. that. And now you get into storytelling, but that's a whole different thing. But, you know, yeah. rule number one in your lexicon, rule, revenue rule number one, be really well-versed in your customer's language, understand it, speak it. It's like a foreign language. If, you, if, if I'm going to go to France, um, I better know how to speak French because I'm not going to have a successful sale otherwise. Well, you're, you're so right. And I think what's interesting is like you said a bunch of different things, industry, the vocabulary. Vocabulary is incredibly mis or under, under leveraged, right? Or you may not recognize just how important vocabulary is especially like when you're in the industry, there's buzzwords, there's, there's lingo, there's, you know, key phrases and, and, and that trigger, I know you and your business and just by the vocabulary words that I'm using convey that I, I know them and I know you, right? I remember my, when I was an Accenture consultant early in my career and I went from a media client, I worked there for four and a half years and I went into telecommunications client. I didn't know a thing about telecommunications, right? Um, it was at Verizon and it was like a foreign language. I mean, it just, the amount of effort it took just to understand a basic business conversation, I, I was so far behind because I just didn't know the vocabulary. And, and with the tools, Tom, that we have today, um, you know, you could sneak by uh, and get by with just the 30 minutes before the meeting do a quick Google, telecommunications, media, et cetera, what's happening? Like, just pick it up. 
but hopefully you could spend a few days ahead of that. Just do a little bit of research, understand some of the things, maybe read the Wall Street Journal on that particular topic, have something of controversy. So let me give you the exact example. Um, JP Morgan Chase just today uh, started off the earnings season for the big banks in, in, in North America with quarter one results. And you know, understanding the big geopolitical situation we're in, the interest rate environment we're in, I happen to come from banking, but if you didn't and you were pitching someone in the banking space, you just read today's news and say, okay, um, the Fed's going to be raising interest rates. What is that doing to the industry? Usually when interest rates go up, banks make a lot of money on their lending product because loans cost more. They don't give that much more money to deposit holders, so the spread goes higher, they make more money. Except we also have a war going on in another part of the world. Right. That's causing uncertainty, volatility, and therefore the capital market side of most big banks, they're not doing IPOs, they're not doing M&A activity, and so on. So that's going to depress things. When we have inflation running, you now have fears of a recession. When you have a recession, right. nobody wants to go and buy a bigger house or a bigger car or buy a boat because everybody's concerned. Banks' profits go down. I've given you three things that you could spend an hour with right. a banker talking about and not have to do any selling. But he or she will say, hey, Tom gets my thing because this is what's on their mind. The big banks are saying it's a tough road ahead. You could just read one article and get some sense of that. Or you right. could even say, hey, I read that uh, JP Morgan just had really, you know, 42% uh, lower profits this year than last year. What do you think of that? And boom, suddenly you're now in that conversation. You're in that wine and cheese and you've just <laughs> lobbed a really good question and suddenly it's like wow you're a banker right right yeah and and you're right you got to stay on top of what's happening in the industry and i was thinking back to like me trying to learn telecom we're talking about things like routers and switches and i'm like what is a switch right and where does these switches live and and there's there's like the, the um like there's different layers like i think is what you're saying is like there's there's you know things you can read about and then as you get deeper into that industry there are bedrock sort of things that you know like a, a switch at Verizon I had no idea what that is where it goes how it works um, and there's just like the technical I guess maybe that is a very technical thing but you know just being able to navigate from news to I don't know something much more detailed if you were kind of geeking out at some financial services event or convention where all of those people congregate it's probably a little bit more technical right whatever that is for financial services where you'd be like a little harder to you know catch up you know or and acronyms or who knows what you're absolutely right and you know i'm sure if the audience is thinking oh what darshan is saying is like i've got to become an expert i'm not saying that at all but what I am saying, and I think you're, you're, you're saying that from your experience, is know enough to be yeah. a player. Know just enough to be a player. You don't have to be the expert. No one's expecting you. I should be an expert on the product I'm selling, the service that I'm offering. I know what digital labor can do. I just happen to know a little bit about what's happening in the banking space. Or if it's insurance, you know, the whole concept, frictionless insurance in my field, right, in the insurance world. That's a big term. Google it. What does that mean? Get the quick paragraph. At least understand a little bit. What is that? How does it apply? Yeah. Hopefully, your team behind you can say, "Oh, hey, here's an example when we can, you know, if it's a policy or if it's a quotation behind the scenes, we're taking certain things, we're putting it through the algorithm, and we can auto-generate an email quote that goes out to you. And maybe that's what our solution is. We have a bot that can do this for you. So." Know enough about it to make yourself valuable to the conversation. Right. And if you don't, you'll just be that pesky salesperson that calls and says, hey, are you interested in buying a bot? It's like, you're never going to get that call back. Right. You're not right. Right. Well, I think that's an interesting point about how this impacts sales, right? Or renewals or growth within an existing customer. Um, and so, like, if you're supporting your sales CS teams, how do you see this kind of playing out? Are you coaching them? Um, are you giving them like monthly, here's what's happening in insurance? Because I suspect there's a variety of industries that Blue Prism supports and 
I suspect that if you're a seller or a CS person, you may be supporting multiple industries. Just making this point a little bit more challenging is you have to kind of stay abreast on four or five potential different industries. And as we know, that's just hard. But like, how do you, like, how do you see this happening within Blue Prism, you know, with you kind of leading the industry vertical? So you're absolutely right. I think on a theoretical basis, we should all, everything that you and I have just shared, that we really should be aware of our customers' um, vocabulary, some of the challenges, what's happening in the industry. That's great if all your accounts are in that same field. Now you, you can learn something and then you can sprinkle it with all your conversations. So let's say you have 10 accounts, you're a key account manager and you have that. But what if your 10 accounts are quite varied? You've got retail, telecom, um, media, banking. Oh my God, it's like, I just, I haven't got the time. Darshan, I get it. You can read the Wall Street Journal, but I, can't, I don't have time to read five different industries. Right. So in, in larger companies like ours, there is this industry SME role, subject matter expert, is usually a role like this where you can go and grab someone to say, hey, I've got a, I've got a retail client coming up. Um, I have a few ideas for that, but I'm not the expert. Is there a retail um, subject matter expert within our company? And so that's the model we have embraced. And you'll find a lot of larger SaaS companies do have vertical experts that can do what we're talking about, which is understand that vocabulary, talk to um, the customer in a way that sounds like you're representing the whole company and that, yep, Blue Prism gets you, ma'am. We right. get the pain. Um, if that's not possible, if you don't have that kind of um, role available, then you're right. The job is much more challenging if you have a varied um, customer base. Still, I think good practice is good practice. Do your best. Yeah, yeah, and right. And maybe there are broader things that you can just learn once and they're all applicable to everybody. Like, for example, whether it's retail, it's supply chain, it's pharmaceuticals, or it's telecom, learn something about AI. Because guess what? AI is everywhere. So learn about maybe quantum computing. Maybe think about what 6G and 5G are doing. In other words, you could have some applications of some of this broader concept in all these industries. And that's enough to start a conversation as well. Well, and I think that leads is a very nice segue into our second revenue rule. So I don't want to jump in, but why don't you share what's the second revenue rule? So the second one is really about if if you have to learn the language and the vocabulary, that's rule number one. Rule number two is learn to embed that vocabulary into a story, into a conversation, and have that conversation in your head. Do a little bit of practice so that you get good. It almost sounds as if it came on came off authentically. In other words, get to new customers with a bit of a practice conversation using the word. So. Uh, I have 10 banks as accounts, suppose. I want to go after five more, brand new. So what I find is everybody in the same industry wants to know what's the other guy doing. And guess what? You are now in the, wow. in the pilot seat because they're one company. They don't talk to their competitors. I, as a trusted advisor, I'm talking to everybody. And without obviously you know, spilling any confidence, what you can do is to say, well, the industry is struggling right now. All the folks I'm talking to, yeah, they're not happy about the interest rates going up. They know it's needed, but they're quickly shoring up their balance sheets, putting a lot of credit loss uh, reserves in place. Oh, yeah, Darshan, that's what we're having to do too. Okay, good to know that everybody right. else is following. Suddenly, I've just given them something that corroborates their own thinking. And so yeah. this is you're leveraging everything that you're speaking about and listening back into that conversation so well and i think what you're you're changing the nature of the conversation like where a lot of salespeople, you know one of the people i talk to a lot of sales leaders is we come in talking too much about the features and the functions yeah. right we talk too much about you know this is what the software can do or this is what our service offering does but they don't speak you know the, the conversation is not speaking to the customer's business it's oftentimes about the feature the function and the service and what you're saying from my perspective is you're taking that story of the you know the the industry the expertise that you're acquiring and building that vocabulary and changing the nature of the conversation about let's talk about the bank the you know the insurance company let's not talk about our technology 
how our software can, you know, do something for you. It's now about, let's talk about the business, right? And you're changing the nature and you're building that trust through the vocabulary and the storytelling and the brokerage of information that you're using. So like you're, you're, you're becoming a trusted advisor. I think that's a, a fantastic word that you just shared. It, um, it's like speaking to a colleague in your own company. That's how you'd like to be perceived, not as an outsider, not as a salesperson. Um, it's as good as if you were right in the organization that you have this transparency. Um, and, and that means you should be truthful about whether it's limitations of your product and so on. I mean, don't go out there and say, hey, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't do it. Don't do it that way. But, you know, don't say yes to everything because then you'll come across as, you know, this is not just stressful. Really. So, you know, I'll give you an example. I'm talking to a bank. And they clearly know the, schedule, the call is scheduled with Blue Prism. So they immediately know it's going to be about RPA. And they're expecting a demo. And this was a recent example a few months ago. Well, it was a half an hour, and I had no slide deck, and I had no demo. I wasn't going to do it. So once we did a little bit of intros, um, they said, OK, well, we're ready. And I said, great. Let me." Let me ask you a few questions. Oh, aren't you going to show us the demo? I said, eventually. I, 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 I'm sure we'll get to it. I didn't want to say no, but I said, I'll get to it. But it's only 30 minutes. And I started out basically, again, I'll use the example I just gave earlier. I said, so with the interest rate environment right now turning inverted, how do you see this in your deposit accounts? And they didn't miss a beat. They just said, oh, my God, we've been talking about that all week, Darshan. We got in Tom into a 15 minute discussion about how this was impacting their business in a really, really negative way. And I said, said, look, I hear a lot of the same angst from other banks. One way that we found that seems to be working with some others is if you can't grow the top line, start saving some money on the expense line. And one big way is to get your loan fulfillment business, get that as efficient as you can. In fact, imagine if we could get your commercial loans from a 21 to a 30 day turnaround time down to about 10. You could put a lot more loans on the books with, a, with no loss of quality checking or of credit um, qualification. Right. Right. Said, oh, well, we'd love to do that. In fact, we're at 40 days right now. And so I spent that half hour talking about pain and one, just one idea, never got into tech. And the next, the, the call finished by saying, we really want to know how. I said, great, I'll have a team put together to walk you through what we've done in another place and to show you a commercial loan uh, program that we can really get done in 10 days. Still never talked about tech. That's and that awesome. carried on and we, we got our, our solution engineer. We had a couple more experts. I joined it, but now I was an observer. I just emceed the situation. They brought a couple of their folks in and guess what? This is about four months ago. They're now finishing their POC and about to launch a pro forma program. So wow. sometimes, Tom, you just have to be respectful, but pivot the conversation. Give them something that they weren't expecting, but do it in a meaningful way. Um, it doesn't work all the time. If you only have IT, they don't care about yield, inverted yield curves. They really don't. <laughs> <laughs> but they just well, want you're to... talking to the business. I mean, you're talking to the people that are running the business. And I think that's an important distinction. You're right, because you've you got to know your audience. It goes back to what you're you're saying before. And obviously, IT people may not know a ton about, you know, I shouldn't stereotype. But you're right. They're, they're focused on IT stuff and trends. And, and yes, there's an overture of the, you know, industry that's impacting. But it's it's a technical conversation. But it is. And, 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 and even then, so you're right, maybe there's a third rule right there, understand your audience. So <laughs> know the vocabulary of your customer, but also know your audience. Like before you go on, just do a quick LinkedIn. Yeah. And if, I know Microsoft bought LinkedIn, but they haven't made it seamless. I'd like to know in Outlook, every time I get an email, I want to just click on the name, take me to their profile. I mean, why hasn't Microsoft done that? I have to literally just still either cut and paste it or type it in manually, because I'd like to know who they are. I can see their background, how long they've been in there. I like to know what they're most proud of, right? Yeah. Because it helps me as a seller understand the motivations. And if I see that it's 29 years in IT, 
I'm not going to be able to have a successful business conversation. But I might find yeah. they have had four different careers in IT. I can try to appeal. So the more you can know about your audience, the better your conversation will be. Well, and I think what what strikes me about that example is how you elevated the conversation to, you know, you you came in at a higher level, right? In, you know, industry impacts that are happening right now, right? Like it's relevant. You know, it could have been small talk. You know, it who knew what they were going to say when you when you asked that question. Obviously, you took like an educated you know, perspective on this is the question I'm going to ask to kind of get them going, how that was going to na navigate itself down to how you could solve it, right? Or the problem that it, it exposed. But I think like elevating the conversation, a lot of people struggle with having that executive to executive sort of conversation. Some of it's because they made it to your first point, don't know the language, don't know what's happening, or they may not even have the confidence to see themselves as a peer to the person that they're selling to, right? I have a, an excellent example uh, and maybe some advice for your audience. Um, the best way to be able to pivot or to have that story is to go to previous customers who have successfully purchased your product or service and ask them, hey, Tom, um, you know, a year ago we approached you and stuff. You've had some great success. Tell me why you chose us. Tell us the path you took and tell us why you're pretty happy with the service that you've gotten. Listen to that story and internalize it and be ready without, you know, uh, without the names and then the logos, be able to retell that story because it's authentic. And now you're taking someone else's view of how they looked at your product, what they saw in it, and you've internalized it and you can offer it to the next customer. That's mm -hmm. a great way to learn it. I just happen to do it through osmosis because I'm listening a lot and therefore I'm picking it all up. And I I, I, I try to tell stories. Stories have yeah, yeah. context, they have a hero, sometimes they have a villain, there's, there's <laughs> drama, there's angst, and then there's a solution, and then usually there's a happy ending, right? So that's a story. Right. Um, yeah. But if you can learn to tell stories, which in marketing we call them case studies, we call them, um, you know, uh, proof of values, but they're all essentially stories. Right. And I'll tell you that the human psyche is all set for listening to stories once upon a time. Just those yeah. magic words. It's like, okay, I'm ready. Tell me the story. Yeah. No, no there's, I've read a couple of books on storytelling. I'm a big fan of that. And I, um, I, I completely agree. And I think that that's, um, you have to hear those stories to your point. Like you just can't manufacture stories. You have to, you have to collect them. Right. And you have to, you know, and that's sometimes hard for organizations to share the stories. Hey, did you hear what we did over, you know, with client A? And you're like, oh, I'm getting that one and that one and that one. And you put them in your pocket and you just shoot stories out left and right. And again, because it's it's external validation, but you as the seller are controlling the narrative essentially of the story. And again, when you're elevating it to the business level, you're building this trust, right, through the stories that you're telling and by speaking to them at a peer or you know at a at a business level not trying to quote unquote sell them something because i think what you you know in the story you the, the example you shared is you try to solve a problem right you didn't try to sell software now that may be the outcome but you said here's what's happening in the market you've got these two different things this was a little bit harder let's go here and then you shared a story about what the other client did and was successful and you could hear i mean i could just see the light bulb go on and as you're telling the story and they're like, you know what, I think we should do that too, right? Ours is 40 days. And all of a sudden, everything else from there is just kind of sales execution and they bought it themselves. You didn't even sell anything. Uh, again, this for what it's worth, anytime you actively have to sell, you're not doing it well. You shouldn't have to sell at all. It should be a Venturi effect. It should just be you know, your storytelling, your understanding of the audience, the vocabulary that you're using, all should just simply lead to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. There is no sale in here. It's simply, right. imagine Tom, a good friend of yours said, hey, you're having a, you haven't seen each other for a while, you're catching up over a beer uh, in one of your favorite pubs, and he tells you, uh, hey, listen, I'm, I've been down this track a little bit, this is really exciting and stuff like that. I'd love Tom for a little bit of your guidance, maybe if you wanna become a partner. There's a story there, and now he didn't sell anything. 
he just says, hey, you can say, how do I partake in this thing, right? Maybe it's a business venture, maybe it's a, maybe it's a little league or something, but you're drawn in without actually ever having been asked. And so I think the best sales are where you've definitely got the vocabulary figured out, there's some relationship, there's some trust now built, and it's the customer that says, so what's the next step, Darshan? Hey, let me, let me bring my team in and we'll go down right to the brass tacks. And then let me walk you through the exact story, but now on a technical level, right? Bring your IT folks in, bring your technical folks in. But guess what? It's the business person who's now going to invite others. And depending on who they are in the organization, there's already a built in. It's like, well, the boss is asking me to go and attend this thing. In other words, the boss is asking me to come, right? Right, right. So right. There's already thinking saying, okay, this is a solution. If the boss has already seen it or heard about it, then there's a higher propensity that someone else is going to say, yeah, dang, this, this works pretty good. They may have a hundred technical questions, which hopefully your team can answer, but the sale has been already made. It may take 90 days to close a million dollar deal, but you're now on that track without actually having to knock on doors and say, do you want to buy a robot? Do you want to buy five robots? It doesn't quite work that way. So that's just my vantage point from what I've learned. And I'm not sure what label to put on it. There's all kinds of labels, you know, uh, uh, but I like your term, trusted advisor. I think uh, to me, if someone comes to me and wants me to, you know, to hear an aggressive sales pitch, I kind of walk the other way. I, I, it's like when you walk into a mall, the first thing that the per person, hello, hi, uh, can I help you with something? Uh, would, you lady, like a sample? would you like a sample? I just walked into your store. Give me a minute. The fact that I'm even here, instead of going anywhere else in the mall, you should be thankful that I'm walking in. Hey, what's your name? Oh, Julie, great. Julie, I'll call you the minute I need help. Give me five minutes to look around. I'm looking for a certain kind of thing. That's it. And instead of saying, can I help you? It's like. Well, and I think there's this level of, um, there's, a, there's a concept in sales, like just your level of detachment as a seller to the outcome, right? So like early on, like everything that looks and smells like a sales opportunity, you just like sink your teeth into and just won't let that go because you're like, I don't have any pipeline and Darshan, are, are you available to me? What's going on? You, you know, you just, you just like attack these opportunities and you're trying to do everything to influence the time. And, but I've learned over time, you can't influence the customer's buying timeline. You really can't, right? You can hurt yourself in the process, but you're not going to speed them up oftentimes, right? Based on some gimmick or, you know, something. So the more you can detach from the outcome as a seller and just let me try to help you, maybe it'll work today, maybe it'll work next month, maybe in six months, or maybe never. But it, it you know, the, the less you try to sell, the better you are likely doing it. Um, Tom, you've said it in a great way. Let me add a story to the advice you just mentioned. We worked with a, uh, again, a large financial institution, a regional one in the Northeast, and you know, they were pretty happy with our, our product, our platform, but they didn't really engage with us. And when we started engaging with them, I was called to sit on the team to represent Blue Prism. There was a few of us. And because I happened to be the industry lead, I was asked my opinion. So I said everything we've talk, been talking about for the last uh, half hour. I said, guys, if you're trying to sell them, you know, 50 more robots, I think let's, let's just ease into the conversation. I suggest we set up a bi-weekly 30 minute chat, right? Just to say, hey, we're here. Um, let's offer some, some uh, in French, les bons mots, some nice things to say every time we meet, some industry news, something maybe on our platform. Let's see where this relationship goes. Let's win their confidence uh, that we're just here. Every two weeks we're here to chat, but more than, hey, have you got anything on your agenda? I haven't got anything. Okay, we'll give everybody back 15 minutes. No, that's not what I mean by a cadence call. There's gotta be value there. Let's carry that on. Let me jump to the end game. Seven months after doing that, having decent conversations, we became friends. Friends in the sense to say, hey, uh, as soon as COVID is over, man, like we got to get together for a drink. Oh, Darshan, I'd love that. Not just me, but everybody else on the team. We should definitely do that. Completely unasked, unrequested. At the end of one of these calls, Tom, said, and guys, you know what? We've been really enjoying these calls and you've given us so many things to think about. We've had a couple of internal discussions over the past month or so. We'd like to double the size of our digital workforce. 
and and I just without missing a beat, uh, and and the account man, uh, director, uh, we both said, "Hey, that sounds great. Let's talk more about it at our next call." Yeah, that sounds great. In other words, just. And then as soon as I hung up, I got on the team. Holy crap! What just happened? And everybody on the team was like, "What just happened there?" And we were so excited. But on the call, we just played it cool. Say, "Hey, that's great. We'll chat about it more in the next time." And that's truly what. So the lesson from this, exactly as you mentioned. You can't predict the customer, so don't even try. Don't force it. But if you do, all the things we talked about, understand their pains, understand some wins, speak their language, become trusted. If you can, be collegial, become a friend. You never know just when. Boom, they want more stuff from you. Yeah, no, that's awesome. No, I love it. That's great. We got to see some of your storytelling in action, so that's, uh, that's an extra bonus here. Um, here on the Revenue Hustle. So, um, Darshan, how did you navigate your career? How did you get here? What have you been up to? You know, that's another whole thing is uh, I've got four kids, Tom, and uh, they're all uh, in, in college right now. One's just about to graduate and one just started last year. So um, I've been thinking a lot about careers and if I had to do mine again, how would I do it? You know, it's always a what if and how would life sure. turn different? But I'm realizing you know, having been in the workforce, what, over 35 years now, opportunities you could never predict. Uh, decisions that you make should never look back on. You made the decision and yep. life has turned out. You know, I had no idea what the letters M, B, and A stood for when I finished my undergraduate. I wanted to work in a clinic doing cancer research. That was what I thought I wanted to do. So I got an undergrad degree in uh, microbiology, in the in the organic chemistry, and all that line of science. Wow. I love science. I just loved it. I love the equations around it. You know, I finished my degree and I said, and of course I got some exposure to clinical work and stuff. I had the white coat and I, I said, okay, so I'm gonna be working in a lab for the rest of my life? <laughs> no. I'll tell you what changed my mind was I took this, um, I guess we call it a gap year now, at least when my kids are telling me, but in those days it was called slumming around Europe you know, with a backpack. <laughs> so I took four months after my undergrad and uh, I got a URL pass and spent four months just hanging out. And I realized how big this world was. And when I came back, I said, I wanna work in a field that'll connect me. And it took a while, a few months, uh, went back to my placement office at the, at the university and it turned out that business, business would give me exposure on mm -hmm. this big wide world. Now we're talking the 1980s, there was no internet in those days. <laughs> uh, no mobile phones, nothing. It was, you had to literally look up journals. So I went on and did a business degree and I got a chance then to actually go back to Europe and uh, did a summer semester um, at one of the big uh, economic schools there. From there, um, I understood, okay, this is a field that I can really have a lot of fun with. Um, so I started at Nestle seven years understanding everything about food and beverage production, marketing. In fact, I got a chance to go into IT, never having touched anything. Hmm. That via personal computer came out in 1981. Uh, by 1987, there was still not a single desktop uh, in the division at Nestle that I was in. The only systems we had were Olivetti and Wang, and the secretaries used them for word processing, because that's what they did. Um, when I became IT manager, I said to my boss, I said, why are you making me an IT? I know nothing about it. He says, good, because you're gonna ask all the stupid questions that if I ask them, I'll look bad, but you can ask them because you know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. We got barcoding in, in warehouses on our forklifts. That had never been done before. I got desktops for all our head office staff. I finished up in corporate strategy and then I went into banking after that. Just again, seven years at Nestle, great, completely new world. Uh, five years in banking. I was doing some consulting work on the side and for 20 years in different forms, I've done banking related consulting work. This is my first opportunity here at Blue Prism. I've joined now about a year and a bit ago um, in sort of a SaaS software mm -hmm. enterprise sales kind of uh, uh, career mode. And I'll tell you, everything I've learned, whether it's from my Nestle days, my banking days, or my consulting days, I use it every day. It all yeah. comes back. It all builds on itself. So the storytelling I learned in consulting, the vocabulary I learned in banking, the understanding of the P&L I learned back at Nestle. 
it's still all here. So you never know where the future takes you. You don't know where life yeah. will take you. But if you keep learning and never stop, there's no downside. Awesome. No, that's a great story. I didn't realize you worked at Nestle. That's a uh, interesting place to start. And then um, navigating into banking and you can see the consulting in all the stories you're talking, you're advising, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's core to kind of what you were saying today. So uh, where can we follow you online, Darshan? Uh, well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm quite, um, uh, quite active on LinkedIn, posting uh, just things that I see and giving my two cents on them um, and responding to what other people write. So you can always find me on LinkedIn. And uh, some of the work that I've done, I've just put some media links as well there. So happy to, uh, to engage in conversations with your audience if they'd like to reach out or for me to reach out to them if anybody would like um, to have a, have a continued chat on some of my experiences. And I'd love to learn some of their stories because to me, that's all about that. There's nothing greater than I'd love to do is grab a glass of wine and listen to a fantastic story. It's just a great way to spend time. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the Revenue Hustle. This has been a fantastic uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, I've loved hearing your experiences and there's a lot to take away. So thank you so much. Uh, let's do it again soon. Tom, a real pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for tuning in to the Revenue Hustle. This episode has been brought to you by Nine Lenses. Close more deals with interactive assessments. Check them out at ninelenses.com. See you next time.